again, welcome to our special program this afternoon called Afghanistan, What Went Wrong? My name is Chad Hoseth. I'm the Assistant Vice Provost for International Affairs in the Office of International Programs at Colorado State University. Um, thank you for joining us for this important conversation today. Let me first offer a few housekeeping updates before we get into our event. First, closed captioning is available for this event through our Zoom webinar functionality. The bottom of your screen, either under the three dots if your screen is compressed or under the CC button, you should be able to hit show subtitle and make uh, and enable closed captioning for this program today. We will have a conversation for approximately half an hour among our um, presenters today, but then we're going to reserve a whole lot of time for ample question and answer opportunity for all of you in the audience. So you'll see a Q&A box, please. Um, actively submit comments, questions, and ideas that uh, you'd like to hear reflections from our speakers today. We'll take those and get to as many of those questions as we can during the second portion, um, the last half hour of our event today. Again, as you heard, we are recording our event, and this will be available and posted on our International Programs website soon as well. With that, let me introduce Kathleen Fairfax, our Vice Provost for International Affairs, who will then introduce today's speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Chad, and, and welcome to all the uh, people in the audience who are here for our program today, and especially welcome to our two speakers. And this is a very timely and important topic, uh, so I'm glad we are addressing it today. I'd like to introduce our two speakers, and they will uh, have a conversation, and then, as Chad said, be able to reflect on questions and comments from you all as well. So we have Nader Hashima, and he is the director of the Center for Middle East Studies and associate professor of Middle East and Islamic politics at the Joseph Corbo School of International Studies at the University of Denver. He is the author of Islam, Secularism, and Liberal Democracy Toward a Democratic Theory for Muslim Societies. And his next book project is on the global destabilizing effects of Middle East authoritarianism. So welcome to Nader. And then Amran Qureshi is a wartime fellow at the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard Law School. He's also a past fellow of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School of Government. He is a co-editor of the New Crusades, Constructing the Muslim Enemy. His articles and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, and the Guardian Weekly. So we're very pleased and honored to have uh, both of you all with us today. And I really look forward to hearing what you have to say about Afghanistan. So take it away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for tuning in. A special thanks to Shauna DeLuca at the Office of International Programs at Colorado State University for this invitation. I'm sorry that we can't be meeting in person. On August the 30th, the last remaining U.S. troops left Afghanistan. This brought to an end America's longest war, longer than World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War combined. Approximately 800,000 U.S. troops passed through Afghanistan over the past 20 years. Uh, approximately 2,500 American troops were killed. Tens of thousands of more were injured. Uh, 1,100 uh, NATO troops were also killed in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. On the Afghan side, roughly 241,000 have been killed in the Afghanistan and Pakistan war zones since 2001. More than 71,000 of those have been civilians, according to the Cost of War Project at the Watson Institute at Brown University. This includes also 66,000 Afghan security forces who were killed during this time period. And the estimated cost of America's longest war is uh, $1 trillion. The chaos that we witnessed in Afghanistan during the last weeks of August highlights the colossal failure of America's longest war. It's not an exaggeration to say um, that the failure has been total, the humiliation complete. To drive home this point, during the same week that we commemorated the 20th anniversary of 9-11, the Taliban announced the formation of their new government in Kabul. So what went wrong in Afghanistan? What are the key political, military, strategic, and moral lessons that should be learned? What comes next for Afghanistan? 
What are some of the key human rights implications of the return of the Taliban to power? What are some of the geopolitical implications of this historical event? To help me answer these questions is my colleague at Harvard University, Imran Qureshi. I've long uh, uh, admired and respected his political analysis, his judgment and his interpretation. Uh, we are longstanding collaborators and colleagues. We're currently working on a forthcoming uh, edited volume on Islam and human rights. And it's great to be in dialogue with him today. Um, uh, we have roughly half an hour for a conversation, then we're going to switch to Q&A. So before I pose sort of the first question to you, Emron, since I view this as an educational event, I'm wondering uh, what your top three picks are uh, in terms of analysis and interpretation that you've read over the last roughly, you know, um, month and a half since, since the American troops left. Uh, what stands out in your mind in terms of sort of must read essays or articles? Um, first, I want to thank our host at Fort Collins and Fort Collins for inviting us. And I really regret not being here in person. I've long wanted to visit your campus, and I hope that we will one day in the not so distant future convene in in, in the flesh as opposed to in a Zoom chat. Um, our our discussions on this subject go back um, a long time, twenty years, uh, nineteen ninety nine and two thousand. I don't know if you remember. I I was so fascinated by the pathology of the Taliban that I had a listserv called Taliban Watch. And I was so outraged by what they had done to the Buddhist statuary in Bamayan province that I started a petition um, of art historians and literary figures. And that became my interest and engagement. And about that time around 2004, we both co-authored the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam entry on human rights. And while we were producing that, um, uh, essay that was in schematic form, someone asked me if I'd be interested in doing the entry on the Taliban. And I was incredulous. I said, look, someone must have done it. They said, no, there's no interest. And I, I, I went off and did that with Michael Semple. So we both have had a longstanding interest in Afghanistan and the Taliban. And it seems like it's come full circle. To answer your question, um, I think that, you know, there, there, there are a number of people that i I, I pay attention to right now. They might not necessarily have books, but they might have articles. So there is an, uh, a, a, name, a, a man named Ibrahim uh, Bahisi, who's with the International Crisis Group, and he writes on Afghanistan. Patricia Ghostman, who's the Associate Asia Director for Human Rights Watch, and she pays uh, particular attention to issues of gender. Uh, Anand Gopal, who wrote a really seminal piece in The New Yorker, on, on, on one particular area and one woman named Shakira and used her as a lens as to why um, the United States lost the war in Afghanistan. Um, Bilal Sarwari, who is um, an Afghan journalist who fled and is now living in Toronto. Um, and then there are a whole raft of authors and some of them are um, uh, Antonio Gustazi, who wrote a book called Decoding the Taliban uh, uh, a, a historian named Louis Dupuis who passed away and he wrote a book in 1980 uh, that was a cultural and historical um, exploration of Afghanistan. So um, my approach is unfortunately very simple. I try and read everything. <laughs> and then after you read as much as you can possibly digest, you get some broader contours. But I think, you know, um, Ghostman, Bahasi, Anand Gopal, and Gustasi, Antonio Gustasi would be good starts. Right. Good. Yeah. Um, I just, in the interest of time, I'll just mention three pieces that I've read recently that I want to strongly recommend to the audience. And they focus specifically on the big question that we are talking about today, what went wrong in Afghanistan. So the Anan Gopal piece that appeared in the New Yorker uh, last month, it was on the, uh, the, the September 13th uh, print edition of the New Yorker called The Other Afghan Women is absolutely an essential read. I mean, I just read it today. Um, and I think it's worthy of a Pulitzer Prize. If you want to understand why the Taliban won and why the Americans lost, um, read that piece. It's, um, it's truly outstanding journalism. The second piece that I think is absolutely important from an American perspective, from a US foreign policy perspective, is the new book called The Afghanistan Papers by Washington Post correspondent uh, Craig Whitlock, a, a Secret History of the War. I happen to have the book in front of me. Um, I'm almost done reading it. And basically, this is a book that looks at the internal uh, Pentagon, 
um, State Department and White House deliberations that were recorded and discussed internally about the war in Afghanistan that, were very, that was very frank and very honest and presented a picture that was very different from the public statements that the American government was telling the world. Uh, the internal conversations was that the United States was losing the war, that things are going very bad. But every year, um, uh, American government officials at the State Department, at the White House, and the Pentagon were painting a very different picture. Um, so this internal archive, um, I think, is absolutely essential read. It's called the Afghanistan Papers because it has the uh, direct resonance and echo of um, the Pentagon Papers that were released by um, exposed by Daniel Ellsberg that exposed the internal uh, secret American sort of discussion over the Vietnam War, uh, telling very similar story that the war was going very bad, but you know lies were told but to the American public. And the last piece that I'd recommend strongly is one that I was very excited about. It's by Sarah Chayas that appeared in Foreign Affairs roughly a month ago. And Sarah Chayas is a expert on corruption. And she happened to spend a lot of time on the ground in Afghanistan, particularly in Kandahar, advising the American military mission. She was the uh, prime, one of the key advisors to General McChrystal, um, who led the, the war in Afghanistan. And she details um, the, um, the extent of corruption that existed in the American war effort, her attempts to draw the attention of uh, the American government to this corruption that, is, that was undermining the war effort, and how no one took her seriously. And she also draws an important link with you know, corruption in Afghanistan and corruption within um, uh, the American and political experiment here in the United States. It's absolutely an essential, outstanding read by someone who has a lot of credentials. So those are the three pieces uh, that I'd strongly recommend. Uh, people can email me. I'd be happy to give you the references. Um, so Emron, so the first question is sort of the obvious question. If you could sort of take a step back and in broad terms sort of paint us a picture, um, you know, what went wrong in Afghanistan? What would you say are the key themes that stand out in your mind, having sort of studied this topic and looked at this topic that can explain this colossal and very humiliating defeat? Well, first, I'm not sure I'm going to use the words humiliating defeat because most insurgencies win out against counterinsurgent forces. So it's really, for me, a policy failure. And if we look back at when um, President and Biden decided to withdraw American troops. It's really interesting to look at how the elites, the, the, the chattering classes in the New York Times, the Washington Post, foreign affairs, foreign policy, both Democrat and Republic, all said that this is a horrific move. We're gonna, we shouldn't leave. We should be there forever, essentially. And things are going swimmingly well, or if they're not going swimmingly well, they're not going as bad as what you know, President Biden has wrought upon the world. So, so the first question is, this is really a failure of, of elites that craft foreign policy to discern what took place, what was going wrong, to do what you just outlined. But even pretty much to this moment, they're, they're in a form of denial. So um, I think that um, when you look at this, uh, I, I'm gonna stand back and just say, if we frame this moment from a geopolitical frame perspective, I think that this is this is a watershed moment that's um, transformative. And I know this is a word and term that's used successfully, but if we look at this, it resembles at some level the transition at the end of the Second World War between an exhausted Great Britain and an emerging American power. And this is a moment where we have an Eurasian future with China ascendant an American power clearly in decline or collapsing. So this is a kind of transformative moment where uh, one power is rising in its mind and another power is being viewed as um, declining. And so this has broad geopolitical ramifications and we're seeing them happen in the South China Seas with Taiwan where China feels that it can do things that it didn't have um, the artistic license to do so before. So if, if we frame the question, what went wrong? I, 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 I'm not sure if I like these adjectives. I, I think that for me, it's looking at the historical moment and kind of figuring out or trying to figure out from an analytical perspective, what's happening in front of us. So I think for me, there are questions of political legitimacy that we want to explore. Mm -hmm. There are questions about uh, internal security and regional security in the region questions about political governance that are tied to legitimacy, the humanitarian crisis that's um, kind of befalling Afghanistan as we speak, and then the question of gender and women, because um, out of all of this, 
the Taliban have very clear negative consequences for half of the population. So, and they seem to have regressed or returned to um, um, the frame that they were in from 1996 to 2001 when they were in power. So those are the kind of um, overarching frames, one of a superpower rivalry, one of polit political legitimacy, one of security governance, humanitarianism. So I, I think that these are how we should look at this moment. Okay. And within that, within that, it's the question of what went wrong or, or what happened. And, and this is, as you know, this is a term that Bernard Lewis used to, to frame understanding the Middle East. And so the question is, when you have a regime that is uh, uh, the Ghani regime and previous regimes that were viewed as largely corrupt, autocratic, and kleptocratic in outlook uh, and provided no form of, of legitimacy and no form of security uh, for its citizens, then when you kick it, it's going to come crumbling down. And that's what happened. Well, know, this is, let, me, let, me, let me focus in on that point because um, you know when you take a step back, you look at the balance of military forces. We're talking about the most powerful military alliance in the history of humanity. Uh, losing a war to a a bunch of you know tribal uh, militants who are drunk on an extremist interpretation of Islam, and after twenty years they walk into Kabul, and the Americans you know flee in a very humiliating way. A um, trillion dollars is spent by the United States and its allies, and at the end of the day, one of the big tragedies here, as you just alluded to, is that the the American backed Afghan government, led by Ashraf Ghani is so monumentally corrupt, so monumentally illegitimate. And in comparison, all the reports that we're getting is that the Taliban, notwithstanding their you know, extremist ideology, are less corrupt and have greater legitimacy, particularly in the countryside, than the Western-backed um, you know, Afghan government and Afghan army, which just sort of collapses overnight. So all of that demands, you know, I think, a deeper understanding and critique as to exactly why after 20 years that things went so colossally wrong. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, um, you alluded to the essay by Anand Gopal from the New Yorker that you liked. So I would encourage um, our audience and participants to, to read that essay very carefully because it kind of looked at the question of when do insurgencies win and when do counterinsurgencies fail? And it very, in a very crude way, what, what happens is that, you know, you have drone strikes, you have airstrikes that kill a lot of civilians indiscriminately. And in that article, which was kind of a microcosm, you had, you had um, rival ethnic factions and rival clans calling out strikes for the rivals, against the rivals. So you had a lot of civilian casualties, which turned the population against the state mm -hmm. and then uh the article also pointed out that everyone knew who the taliban were they had basically gone home they had gone into retirement but then they were harassed they were attacked they were tortured so we had we had a state that was using violence indiscriminately against civilians and it loses legitimacy so if you use that against all of your all of all of the regions where the Taliban was largely uh, powerful or had some exercise, some control, you're going to turn the population against you. And it has parallels with what took place in Vietnam, what took place in Algeria. So it was really very predictable. Mm -hmm. When you use violence indiscriminately against civilian populations, you will turn the people against you. Yeah. And in that case, the state didn't protect the, the citizens. It used the violence of a foreign force instrumentally in indiscriminate ways. Yeah, now that's, that's a very good point. I mean, um, most of the listeners to this program will recall on the second to last day in August before the American troops left Afghanistan, there was a, uh, a US drone strike on a suspected ISIS target that was described as a righteous attack uh, in the early hours after the strike took place. And then it was eventually revealed 
that the uh, ISIS target was was not an ISIS target. It was a civilian who worked for, you know, American an American company. And in the the context of that strike, ten members of one family, including seven children, the youngest being two years old, were were killed in this drone strike that um, is effectively, you know, a massacre. And you know, reading, um, uh, reminding ourselves of that story. Uh, that has now been publicly admitted by the Pentagon and apologies have been made and they're trying to actually bring the family to the United States. And then reading the Anand Gopal piece in the New Yorker shows that there is, uh, there was a clear uh, policy of these types of indiscriminate attacks, you know, shoot first, ask questions later that effectively, you know, um, uh, turned the population in the countryside um, uh, against the American uh, intervention in Afghanistan. And, you know, Anand begins his, his article in the New Yorker by reminding us that 70% of the population, you know, lives in rural areas. You know, Afghanistan is more than just Kabul. And that contrast between the urban center, the urban cities, Kabul in particular, and the countryside, you know, comes through. Um, and then, you know, you, the more you read the article, you see that, you know, there's this one actually very moving section that really just shocked me where, you know, he's, he's, he's investigating this story through the village, this one village in Helmand province through the lens of this woman, Shakira. And then he goes around and he sort of asks Shakira how many members of her family have been killed in American drone strikes. And it's in the dozens. And then he asks other members within the same village how many members of their family have been killed. And each of them report dozens of family members killed. So this is not just a one-off. This was clearly a policy that went awry uh, and that had, I think, you know, it was the opposite of winning hearts and minds. It actually lost hearts and minds. And when the, Af when, and the Taliban returned, there was a sense that, look, we don't like these people, but at least the war is over and they're less corrupt than the, you know, American backed government in Kabul. So I think that's absolutely essential. I don't think that um, uh, element of the war in Afghanistan has been properly been told to a mainstream American argument. So I, I, I draw I draw everyone's attention to that piece. Uh, look, Imran, time is quickly. So I'll, I'll just forward. follow up Go on ahead. the Kabul strike because that happened literally at the time when um, the U.S. last flight was taking off on, 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 on the 30th, right, mm -hmm. of right. August. And so uh, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki described that the drone strike that wiped out that entire family as successful. And it's really, in my estimation, a masterclass tutorial on how the U.S. lost the war in Afghanistan. And so, as you point out, 10 members of a family died in that attack. And an Afghan journalist said, and I'll quote, it's very symbolic that U.S. operations in Afghanistan started with drone strikes and ended with drone strikes. It seemed as if they learned nothing in 20 years. So uh, if you take in the rural areas that in, in Helmand province where Anand Gopal went to, uh, a, a, a tribal society, a, a clan-based society, and you kill members of that clan, you're gonna turn a lot of people against you. And a lot of the fighters that joined the Taliban came from that province. And it's no surprise. Right. So here's a, a developmental question, uh, Emron, that speaks to the, the core of the American challenge in Afghanistan that went uh, terribly wrong. Um, Afghanistan is one of the most underdeveloped, traditional, conservative, and more ravaged parts of the world. Uh, it's widely recognized that the idea of a uh, Afghan identity, we sort of assume there's a country called Afghanistan and most people identify with being an Afghan, but from a, uh, a nation building perspective, um, it's recognized by experts that primary loyalties that people have in Afghanistan is not to the nation state, but it's to much more provincial and much more local uh, loyalties, tribal loyalties, ethnic loyalties. Um, and so the question is the following. Uh, I recall your colleague at Harvard, Rory Stewart, who spent time in Afghanistan, um, both, you know, as a citizen and as part of the, you know, NATO mission, uh, making the observation that if things went perfect in Afghanistan, in other words, if there was no Taliban insurgency, if things went according to plan, we would be lucky that after 30 years of a successful intervention in Afghanistan, after 30 years, we might be able to bring Afghanistan up to the developmental level of where Pakistan is today. So the point being is that the American attempt to organize a, an Afghan government, an Afghan you know, political system to engage in nation building and state building was from its inception a very tall order, notwithstanding the Taliban insurgency. 
Um, so the argument being is that, look, even though the United States failed, it was a tall order to begin with. Any thoughts on that? I'm not sure if I entirely agree with them. So I guess we're, we're having a contrarian discussion today. So Rory Stewart was was a colleague of mine and and he had a very kind of um, kind of cynical real politique take on Afghanistan. And so some people could argue with that, but identity is crafted over time. And and and, and Afghanistan post 9-11 was you know scant 20 years old. And so I'm gonna make a counter argument that over 20 years in places and urban settings, we saw uh, incredible progress of Afghan women in society. We saw universities opening, we saw them uh, flourishing in ways that were not possible in the past. And so uh, identity is, is both, uh, can be national, it can be ethnic, it can be religious, it can be cultural, and it can be imaginary in, in the sense that you imagine certain assumptions of the societies that you live in. And so for me, when I look at the transformation of Afghan women, um, as, I, as I mentioned to you um, on August 30th, um, the best marks right now of entrance scores coming into Afghan's university system are by women. So they're doing really, really well. So we had a, a cadre of young men and women that were rising to the challenge, that were envisioning uh, a new Afghanistan. Yes, they might have been cloistered in Kabul. Yes, they might not be seeing um, the depredations that their countrymen were experiencing in, in Halmad and elsewhere. But, but I think that there were possibilities of a new future. So regarding identity, there was the identity that was both national, ethnic, religious, and then there's the identity of also young Afghans that are envisioning the possibilities that exist. So I think that for me, these are fluid concepts and ideas that represent um, how we want to frame the world that we live in. So they're not casting complete, right? The other point right. that I'll try to make with Rory, I would say, look, we have Afghan society that has been drenched in war since the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. So we had the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. We had the, um, we had the Taliban, then we had 9-11. And so it's a society or state and society that has been convulsed by violence. And at some level that traumatizes society and it, it, it kind of um, shapes it in particular ways. So the, the, the kind of negative um, depiction that he had on a developmental frame, uh, I would say if you contrast Pakistan, Pakistan didn't experience three wars that traumatized its soil. And it, you, you did not have the Soviets invade uh, Pakistan you did not have uh, you know, the Taliban takeover from 1996 to 2001, and you didn't have um, um, you know, the Americans in Bay Pakistan. So okay. it's a facetious, facetious um, um, a kind of example, but it almost kind of neocolonial in some manner that he makes that pronouncement. Okay, um, I, I wanna get to questions and answers in a second, but one last question, because we've been talking right now about the past. So one last question before we get to the Q&A session, and this is a question about the future. Uh, the Taliban are in power. They've controlled, they control most of the country. Um, what next? Uh, what uh, policies should the international community be pursuing now, given uh, this reality of Taliban full control, given their ideological extremism, given um, the status of women, the status of minorities, um, how should the international community be engaging with the Taliban? Should it be complete boycott? Should there be some interaction? Um, how can we best help, um, particularly the women of Afghanistan, the girls of Afghanistan, the minorities in Afghanistan going forward? Any thoughts on that? Um yeah, I'll try to unpack that. I'll, I'll point out that um, there's a journalist named Mortaza Hussein who wrote a piece in The Intercept and, um, uh, about a month and a half ago, and he said that Afghanistan is about to be engulfed in a humanitarian crisis caused by this conflict and COVID. And so um, the West will have to find some way in which to respond to work with the Taliban government or to preferably bypass them and to provide humanitarian relief work directly. So if we look at the numbers right now, um, the numbers are, are, are quite staggering. They're 
Um, UNHCR is saying that there are 10 million Afghans that are food insecure. The, the numbers of Afghans displaced by conflict this year is roughly 270,000 and could rise to half a million UNHCR reports. And so we, we see that, um, and, that's, and that's in addition to some three and a half million Afghans that are internally displaced and two and a half million Afghan refugees uh, in Pakistan and Iran. And its population is 30.1 million. And so, and that, and, and this is a, a very resilient population of people, uh, a predominantly young population. And it's been um, experiencing conflict, displacement, natural disasters, droughts in some parts of Afghanistan. So the West will have to find some way to get aid directly to Afghanistan. And I think it was um, the UN Secretary General who's, who said that um, a few weeks ago that they raised a billion dollars to donate in aid, aid to Afghanistan. And that the Taliban will allow UN uh, aid workers to directly bring that aid. In terms of women, it just is a very um, sad story. And, and I, I'm not sure if I have an easy answer. If we look at unpack the Taliban, the Taliban generationally are, are three, there are three, there are three broad um, aggregate communities. The, the, the Taliban that fought the Soviets, the Taliban that fought the Americans and created a state between 1996 and 2001. And they're somewhat more pragmatic in comparison to the young Talibs that, are, that seized control of Kabul and, and elsewhere. It's the young Taliban fighters that are, are, are more violent, more idealistic, more jihadi in their intent, and more um, um, dramatically uncompromising. And the, the Taliban is fearful that if they make too many compromises, they will lose uh, 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 segments of their uh, of that of that uh, of that of the fighters to Islamic State and to other more radical movements. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, a very fluid situation. I, I think the answer is Western aid will have to continue, perhaps directly, and by bringing direct aid, perhaps there's ways to help women. Uh, right now we see what's happening in Kabul and elsewhere. Uh, universities are being shut down to women. They've been told to go back home. Uh, uh, secondary schools have been uh, shut to, to women. So it's just a, a very dark moment. So I, I don't know how this is going to play out. We were hopeful that, that this was going to be Taliban 2.0, as the Pakistanis described it, right? And that they'd learned the lessons from 1996, 2001, and they weren't going to be as pathological as they were then. And it seems as if that is not the case for women. So, Right. Okay. Look, there's a lot that we didn't get a chance to talk about. Perhaps we can address it during the Q&A session, the role of Pakistan, the role of you know ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But let me turn to uh, Chad, who's uh, going to help us here with the questions and answers. And we have, I think, about 25 minutes. So Chad, over to you. Thank you so very much. Thanks for this very engaged and uh, just fascinating conversation. A lot of engagement from our uh, audience members as well, but I'll remind everyone, please feel free to drop a question into the Q&A and we'll get again to as many of these questions as we can in our reminding time together. Nader, your final question that sort of pivoted us to imagine the future um, is, is resonating, I'll say with the audience, a whole lot of questions about the future. So. I'll synthesize a few of them. And in some ways, it's just an extension of the conversation you've just had, mm -hmm. but perhaps not, or I'll, I'll give you a chance to also weigh in on this notion of what happens next, particularly with Taliban, right? Taliban 2.0, um, Imran, you, you, you noted the word um, fluid several times uh, in your kind of remarks over the last 20 or so minutes and talked about the pathology of the Taliban as well. Um, what, what do you imagine? the Taliban regime might look like? Um, and will it look different than the regime of 20 years ago? And specifically, Sophia asks, do you think that the new government under the Taliban is sustainable, especially with the withdrawal of foreign aid? Yeah. That, I'm going that, to mention one optimistic note, Nader. Sure. Uh, out of all of this uh, bleak um, horror that we see unfolding before our eyes, all of us see images of women confronting the Taliban in the streets of Kabul and elsewhere protesting 
And that shocked the young Taliban fighters. They didn't expect that. They didn't expect women with no guns, with just placards saying, we exist, we have a right to education, we have a right to work. And so there is going to be resistance within half of society. So I, I alluded to the, the question of political legitimacy. If your society actively despises the rulers and is resisting, then that government or that political order is not going to be long, uh, uh, will not survive long. So, so we see throughout Afghanistan, women protesting, girls protesting, in, in, in every aspect, whether it be rural, whether it be urban. So, so that's something that I, I find very, very um, heartening. And, and in this case, resistance is not futile. And hopefully it'll move um, the state into accommodating, accommodating them in some measure in the future. Yeah, um, in terms of the question, is the Taliban rule sustainable? Um, uh, my, my, my gut reaction is that, you know, they eventually are going to fail. I mean, this is largely an insurgent group. Their strength is in fighting the American occupation. They're not strong in terms of how to manage uh, a modern state, uh, a state that you know has roughly you know almost forty million people in it. Um, all the reports we're getting from Afghanistan right now is that the economy is in free fall. Um, you know, th the electricity is going to go off pretty soon. Banks are shut down. Um, uh, workers aren't getting paid. Uh, a humanitarian crisis is looming. So um, that's the prognosis. Of course, you know the Taliban in full control. They have the guns, right? So who's going to stand up to them when push comes to shove? Um, uh, they're going to have the final say. Emron's point is very important that one of the, despite all the failures of the American intervention, there have been successes. And I think we need to acknowledge those successes. Millions of Afghan women and girls went to school and we're seeing the consequences of that right now. They are resisting in small numbers um, uh, against the Taliban. Um, the other, I think, interesting point here that I think speaks to the future and perhaps it gives us some leverage, is that rhetorically speaking, not in terms of policy and behavior, but rhetorically speaking, this is a different Taliban. I mean, you can clearly see that they are talking about, um, you know, uh, I'm just today, for example, before we this program began, I was watching CNN and Calissa Ward, um, uh, uh, who's a very good reporter, is, is on the ground in, 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 in uh, Afghanistan, in Kabul, and she was actually covering a, a protest of Afghan women that was broken up by the Taliban commander. And then when she sort of confronts the Taliban commander, why did you, you know, stop these women who are nonviolently protesting their right to work and go to school? The Taliban commander says, and I'm quoting, I respect women's rights, I respect human rights. Uh, they didn't ask for official permission. That's why we had to close down the demonstration. And then Calissa Ward, you know, to her credit, you know, says, well, if they asked, if they would have asked for formal permission, we, would you have granted them the, uh, the right to protest? And he sort of waffles on that. So the point here is that, you know, in the major cities, we are seeing resistance and pushback. Um, and I think what the international community could be doing is leveraging the aid and the legitimacy that the Taliban deeply seek. So the Taliban wants to have a seat at the United Nations. They want to have official representation. They want international aid. So that international aid and that recognition can be tied to, in my view, can be conditioned on, for example, um, allowing women to go to school and go to work. You know, the Taliban, uh, we can tell them uh, very clearly, you want international aid, you want recognition. Well, these are the terms that we demand of you. And it, it starts with women and it starts with access to education and work. I think that's a that's a conversation, that's a debate. Uh, it's clear to me also there are internal divisions, as Emron alluded to, within the Taliban over the future. This is not simply a you know a return to the Taliban of the late 1990s. There are fissures that we in the West want to exploit and widen as much as possible. So those are my thoughts on 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 a very good question that was posed to you, Chad. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll follow up on that. So there's a that's an excellent point that you raised now. There's that they crave international legitimacy. They want the legitimacy of their neighbors to recognize them: Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Iran, Pakistan, and none of them have provided that uh, recognition. They don't have access to the United Nations, and so all of that's going to be conditional. That they're going to have to play a certain game, play a certain role, and they're going to have to recognize that they will need to uh, accommodate 
certain norms that their society demands of them. And regarding the government, um, I, I'm just going to point out that when the, the government um, um, came in, I, and I, I don't know what day it was announced, or sometime in the middle of September, there were 33 positions, and it was an all-male government. And so when they looked at it, when Antonio Gustazi looked at it, he basically saw you know, the factions within the Taliban that were jostling for control, jostling for you know, important uh, ministerial seats. So the Haqqani network, which uh, represents uh, a group of fighters, and some of these fighters, such as Sirajuddin Haqqani, is on the um, FBI most wanted list for awarded uh, positions. There's the Kandahar faction. And, and towards the end, over the last few weeks, they've started to add more technocratic uh, uh, um, ministers to the mix. So you have engineers, you have doctors, you have people that can actually maybe contribute to a functional government. So we'll have to see how that evolves. But um, part of the government's function is not to serve the citizens of Afghanistan, but to ensure that the Taliban does not collapse into infighting and that the more radical uh, elements aren't poached by Islamic State Khorasan. So it's a kind of, um, it's, it's, it's not a very, it's, it's not easy to read the tea leaves there. Hmm. All right, more, more comments and questions coming in. I'll again remind folks, type something into the Q&A box and I'm doing my best to keep up with what you all have to say and share it with, uh, attend, um, with our speakers. First, I'd, I'd like to kind of relay comments from Alexander who served in, in, um, in Afghanistan, um, kind of reflects a comment, Nader, that you were, we were sort of making and that's regarding kind of progress that had been made. So I, ideologies take generations to change. And if you look at the success that America had in bringing Afghanistan up to what we see as tolerable standards, particularly um, for the women, this was quite a, literally a phenomenal feat. And it was the loss of a base of our ideology, which challenged their own ideologies, which led to their own downfall and success upon our departure. I think juxtaposed with a comment, Alicia also asks, kind of challenges us to, to ask the question, what, what do we imagine Afghanistan was and is and will be? Alicia writes, I'm frustrated with much of the American response to the resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan, which I would summarize as, quote, poor backwards Afghanistan. They couldn't last a week without the US. When my understanding is that the Soviet, British, and US settler um, colonization and invasions of Afghanistan and the surrounding areas led to conditions that allowed the Taliban to thrive in the first place, and now here we are again. How do we reckon with this historical context? Really, the question is, how do we how are we, I also, you know, I'll add my own editorial question. How are we to imagine Afghanistan right now? No, that, 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 those are great questions and comments. I think the picture is a mixed one. Um, I mean, I think getting back to the last 20 years, I think one of the, the tragedies of, us, of Afghanistan is that, you know, the United States and the West went in there um, uh, primarily for you know, national security reasons, but then you know, for nation building reasons, they, they try to develop and support an Afghan government to engage in uh, nation building and then in state building. But what was so tragic about that um, experiment is that um, the, the American intervention and the Western, or I would call them universal values of um, representative government, of a free press, of gender equality, all of these things were you know, very much at least rhetorically part of the American intervention in Afghanistan that we were trying to promote. But the problem was that the side that we were backing was guilty of so much nepotism, so much corruption, so much abuse of power that those very important ideals that I think are universal ideals, gender equality, representative government, free press, and independent judiciary, those ideals at the end of the day didn't matter very much to the vast majority of Afghans, particularly those living in rural areas whose life was really shaped by the war that was taking place around them, including 
the disproportionate use of force by the NATO alliance that was destabilizing you know, the countryside. Uh, and so when you put it all together, and this comes across very powerfully in Anand Gopal's piece in The New Yorker, where, you know, this woman who's interviewed says, look, you know, you're talking to me about women's rights and, and women's rights in, 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 in Kabul. That's all, that's all wonderful. But for us living in the countryside, the only rights that we see is, you know, the right to life and the right to survive. And that was sort of uh, with every passing year as the war dragged on, it became much more unsustainable for us to simply sleep. Um, uh, have a good night's sleep without the war coming to us. Um, and, and there's a lot of details that, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm ignoring here for the sake of time. So I think, you know, I think that's how we have to sort of look at this entire 20 year experience that there were, you know, arguably very good intentions. There were a lot of internal problems, but at the end of the day, um, uh, the, 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 the extent of the corruption, the lack of a clear strategy, and the willingness, I think, this is one of the things that I think explains the, in my view, why the, the war went so bad, the willingness of the American forces to strike deals with warlords, with corrupt uh, politicians who cared fundamentally about lining their own pockets, and not sort of um, engaging in the type of nation building um, uh, um, experiment that we would want them to do, contributed significantly to the failure of this of this project. Emron? Um, I, I've got a couple of points. I'm going to um, respectfully um, disagree with the earlier comment that was raised by a, a veteran who spent time in Afghanistan. I, I, I agree with the with the broad strokes of your argument that because I made them myself as well. But what I'm trying to do is dissuade people, Americans, and from thinking that you know there can be only one path to human rights. And that is kind of Western notions of liberty, equality, and women's rights. And so throughout the Islamic world right now, you see movements of women that are reinterpreting male text and understanding their rights in a particular frame and way. So the, the people that are protesting in the rural areas for their daughters to go to school, to go to have education, to have healthcare, are doing so not on Western grounds, on Islamic grounds. So it's really important to understand that, that this is contested terrain and that as society evolved, these people have evolved their understanding of the world that they inhabit. The other thing I'd like to point out is that um, there is this whole frame of, um, you know, the Taliban are, you know, a product of madrasas and they are. But when we look at the last 30 or 40 years, uh, we basically have seen a period of never ending wars that have shaped generations. And so um, there was a, a very famous political scientist, historian named Iqbal Ahmed, who traveled through Pakistan and Afghanistan. And he visited uh, Kandahar in 1995 on the cusp of their takeover. And he, um, and he wrote this um, he, uh, visiting um, a Kandahar mosque. Um, he, he, interviewed one of the inhabitants of the mosque and the, the elder wrote, not wrote, said the following, they have grown in darkness amidst death. They're angry and ignorant and hate all things that bring joy and peace in life. So the Taliban might have seized power, but their ideology, their ideology is not one that will sustain governance and the evolution of a society. So we, we re, it remains to be seen whether uh, uh, a population that resists them, moves them in, in directions that ameliorates their rough edges. And, and the other point that I want to make more explicit, that if the conflict that existed, uh, you know, between the Taliban and the Americans and the Soviets uh, diminishes, then it might mean that um, the, the kind of uh, driver of violence and, and the, the driver of the Taliban uh, dissipates and that they'll have to uh, respond to governance, to statecraft and to meeting the needs of the citizens. Chad, over to you. So let me um, merge a couple of questions that fall under the broad category of um, sort of geopolitics and specifically, Emron, I think you used the phrase superpower rivalry earlier in the session as well. Uh, so one question is, what's the role of the international community and specifically the United Nations in the future of Afghanistan? And then a second question, 
uh, references China and Russia as having longstanding ties and allyship in the region. Do you imagine that a Russia-China-Afghanistan partnership might have any consequences both in the region and globally? Emron, you want to take the China question because you've been following the China story much more closely than I have yeah. with respect to so, Afghanistan. So, so China is kind of made very nice with the Taliban. And um, um, in the middle of July, there was a delegation of, of Taliban elders that went to um, China and, 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 and basically said, you know, these are our fraternal brothers and we'll make nice with them. So China is uh, looking at Afghanistan with two basic uh, prism. It has a prism of national security and it has the prism of economic exploitation. Uh, Afghanistan is very mineral rich in minerals that are important for uh, various sectors of the economy. And China is looking at that and wants access to it. It's also concerned with um, Xinjiang province and how some Uyghur separatists fled to Afghanistan and have um, uh, more or less engaged in very low level terrorist acts. So it wants, it wants the Afghan uh, Taliban to cooperate and to flush them out and to do something that's uh, very, very dangerous. That is, you have Uyghurs that have fled um, that province, that have fled China, that have settled in places like Kabul, and it wants them to ship back. So it, there's a geopolitical um, um, uh, national security interest. There's uh, an interest in the state next door in Pakistan and tying the fortunes of Afghanistan and Pakistan to China through its Belt and Road Initiative. And the second is um, counterterrorism, and that's the Chinese frame. And right now, it's not going very well for them. In Pakistan, about a month ago, um, uh, Pakistani jihadis attacked Chinese um, um, construction workers and killed nine engineers. So there's, there's um, um, a lot for China to digest. It was euphoric in the fact that it believed that the Americans were defeated, but now it's going to have to um, play in this sandbox, and, 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 and these solutions are not necessarily neat and clean for it. Yeah, very quickly on the UN question. Um, this, I mean, the question reminds me of International Relations 101. This question always comes up, what about the UN when it comes to a particular international crisis? And it's important to point out the UN does not have an independent will. The UN is uh, the sum of its individual parts. The UN Security Council does have sort of powers to pass resolutions and possibly sort of engage in forceful action to deal with international crises. But of course, the permanent members of the Security Council are split and divided divided between roughly, you know, the United States and its allies on the one side and, and China and Russia on the other. Um, and I don't see, you know, that division, um, you know, um, um, amending itself. In fact, it's going to get worse given rising tensions between China and, and the United States. So I don't think we can expect anything substantive in terms of a leadership role from the United Nations, except in the various individual committees. I think the UN Human Rights, um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the reports, the, the, the UN Human Rights Council, the state statements um, by the Secretary General can be sort of a, you know, a clarion call that can draw attention to what's going on in Afghanistan, but it can't play, I think, uh, a more leadership role beyond what I've just outlined. Oh, on that note, now that regionally, um, Russia and uh, Iran did back the Taliban. It was a kind of um, uh, the enemies and my enemy are my friends. And so they're also concerned with Afghan stability in that, that, that this regime moderate its rhetoric and its actions, lest there be uh, refugees that trickle back into um, the Central Asian republics and, and, and destabilizes uh, the broader region. So right. um, both Iran, both um, China, both Russia and the United States have certain similarities of uh, expectations. They don't want expansion of the conflict in an all out civil war. And they want a peaceful resolution. So at some level, all the international players want the same thing from, from Afghanistan. Chad? With, with the few minutes we have left, this may end up being the last question for our time together here. Um, I'll ask this question with then my, you know, a follow-up as I'm, as I'm doing throughout the session here. <laughs> question is, is it reasonable to compare the fall of Kabul to the fall of Saigon? 
And, and then my add on to that is a generation from now, when, when those students and those scholars look back at this period, how will they imagine the fall of Kabul in 2021? Um, and how do you compare that again as we look a generation back right now to the fall of Saigon? Yeah, I'll, I'll very quickly answer that question. I think it's. I think there are many parallels. There's obviously differences because no parallel is exact. Um, but the Vietnam War was a major defeat for the United States, um, and I think this particular uh, war in Afghanistan, as Emron pointed out earlier, is a watershed moment. It sort of highlights the um, undeniable reality of uh, a superpower, in this case, the United States, on the decline, um, the rise of China and the more assertiveness of, of Russia. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions now uh, around the world, particularly among American allies as to will the United States, is the United States a, a reliable ally? And we're seeing this in, in, a, in, a, in what's a very disturbing development uh, in Taiwan right now, where it looks like um, the Communist Party in China is gonna put the squeeze on Taiwan and, and, and well, how is the United States gonna respond? Um, this also has implications, I think, for uh, a lot of conflicts around the world. So I, I think those are some of the big sort of historical, you know, lessons that we can sort of, um, I think, derive from this moment in terms of how historians will look at it. I think this does represent a shift, uh, a global shift in the balance of power. Um, and, it, and it's, you know, it's debatable as to, you know, what's going to come next. Emra? I'll take a quick a final kick if I can. Um, I think, as I alluded to earlier, it's a failure on the part of... Um, uh, American policymakers, foreign policymakers, both liberal and conservative. And Chad, you're exactly right because you alluded to Vietnam and um, uh, what David Havelstam called in Vietnam the best and the brightest. And it was the McNamara's that were formulating policy. And, and they had very little understanding of local realities and were unable to develop real policies. And so it mirrors in my mind um, in an identical way, past failures in Vietnam and, and, and past counterinsurgency efforts. So I remember when General Petraeus came to the Kennedy School, I listened very carefully to all of the um, counterinsurgency doctrine and none of them understood at all in any manner of speaking that if you kill a lot of civilians, you will turn the civilian population against you. And if you have an autocratic, kleptocratic state and regime, it won't survive. So in Vietnam, that lesson was not understood and David Halverson wrote about it. And, um, and we're experiencing something like this today. Um, I'm gonna leave you with one final quote and I, I, I always mangle quotes. So if I mangle this, forgive me, but uh, uh, Cho and Lai was asked about uh, his thoughts on the uh, French Revolution and the quip was apparently it's too early to tell. And so that's what I'll say about Afghanistan uh, for, the, for, for the next five or 10 years. We'll have to see how it, how it unfolds. Yeah, thank you, Chad, and thank you, everyone. I think that's the end of the uh, the program. Too early to tell. I guess that's a, a great note to end on. Thank you, Nader. Thank you, Emron, for spending um, your time, wisdom, and insight with, with all of us here at Colorado State University. Thanks to my colleagues with the International Programs team for bringing this event together. Two quick future programming notes. If this is a topic of sustained interest to you, our political science department is having a panel discussion of their own on Thursday. October 7th in the evening. Um, it's an engaging panel of CSU faculty assessing the 20th anniversary of US intervention of, in Afghanistan. Looking a bit further out in February of 2022, our international programs team is hosting our annual international symposium. Call for proposals is out now. Please contact me. I think you see my name, Chad Hoseth at colostate.edu. If you have questions on any of these events, we'll get you all the information you need. Again, to Nader, to Emron, to all of our attendees today, thanks so much for a lively discussion and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.